Welcome to all of you. We would like to start. My name is Laura Wunder. I'm going to facilitate uh, this day for you. I work with the IPPNW Germany. This is the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War here in Berlin. And I am here with my colleague today and he'll introduce yourself. Yes, warm welcome also from my side. I'm Felix Witschauer. I'm a medical international. And yes, we're going to wrap you through the whole conference today. And yeah, we're happy that you're all here uh, despite this wonderful weather. <laughs> and yeah. Thanks. And we are going to start by hearing a few welcoming words from Katja Monen, who is with the IBPNW and Andreas Wolf, the Berlin representative of Medico International. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, welcome everybody here uh, in this uh, old no, not so old school, that, that has seen the, the Global Health Conference and the Global Health Summer School uh, a couple of times. And so we are happy to be back for this day of meeting and discussion. And uh, so the Global Health Conference, as you have seen, already knows, by, together but organized by the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and Medico International, and I'm the Berlin representative of Medico International, and for 25 years also the Global Health um, Advocate. We are happy to see so many familiar, and particular, so see so many unfamiliar faces, and this shows us that our topic of preparing for permanent crisis has attracted an interest beyond the professionally already involved and engaged colleagues. We hope we can not only bring you a good mix of excellent speakers and panelists in the next few hours, but we want to listen and engage with you all in our workshops that will make the biggest part of our program today. We don't bring answers but questions to our tables here and we hope to find some common ground and fresh thinking by the end of the day that is followed by the week of more discussions in the Global Health Summer School where many of you will participate from tomorrow. When preparing this conference we felt we need urgently to explore together this seemingly contradiction. The world is in multiple crises, an ongoing war of aggression at our doorstep in Ukraine. The climate crisis is bringing us daily terrible news from around the world, from Libya, from Greece, from Italy, from Pakistan. But at the same time, the well-known cycle of panic and neglect has seen the debates of pandemic prevention, preparedness and response that dominated our world in the COVID-19 pandemic, 2020 to 22, be relegated to the usual multilateral diplomacy at the UN, the World Health Organizations, and the European Union, with little hope of substantial change to the status quo. Most symbolically, this was seen in the reluctance to move from a charity model to real global solidarity in sharing the needed tools to counter the pandemic. And even more, in the blatant refusal to change the rules of intellectual property rights at the World Trade Organization. To quote Walter Benjamin, the German philosopher of the 1930s and 40s, that everything goes on like before is the catastrophe. To carry on like this is no option. The ever-running train of history is running in the abyss and we need to find ways to pull the emergency brakes. So we want to explore in this conference ways and actors to substantial change that would give us inspirations for our joint efforts to make the old slogan 
Health for All meaningful, that has guided Medico International and IPPNW together with many other health activists around the world. I wish us an inspiring day. Thank you, Andrea. Um, a very warm welcome also from my side. I'm Katja Monen. I'm a member of IPPNW Germany for about 15 years. I don't have uh, such sophisticated speech as Andreas, but I would like to say some words. So IPPNW, for those who know the organization, is involved mainly uh, to work against nuclear weapons, to abolish nuclear weapons, um, also in the other nuclear issues, uranium munition, etc., all topics that are very relevant still today. But we're also physicians in social responsibility. Um, that's why 10 years ago we started the first Global Health Summer School. What does it mean for us in the Global North? Um, what is our responsibility? How do we work together? How do we collaborate? And also, what does it mean to bring peace in the health field? Usually, if you study medicine or if you're a medical health professional, you have never heard in your training what peace means for health. So that's one thing we want to do. Um, and we are also involved as FPNW to work on security. What does it mean? Security is commonly understood as more military, more walls, more fences, more um, whatever guards in the Mediterranean. That is kind of the security on a policy level. So I would like to ask you in the beginning here, as we gather for that day, to think a bit what do you understand of security? How do you feel when you hear that word? And what is personally, what do you need to feel secure? Please keep that question in your mind um, as we follow through the day together. And I hope to see some of you then in the summer school, in the coming week, on other occasions, and creating an international network in solidarity together to respond in a different way than what we see right now to all the crises that are ongoing. So, have a very good day together with us. Thank you, Katja. All right, before we welcome, introduce and welcome our keynote speaker, I would like to give you a very short run through our program so that you will know what is going to happen today and also give you some organizational information. Um, hmm. there, well, there we had it. Yes. So, as you can see, we are at the moment opening and welcome, so we are going to hear our keynote speech after that. Um, then we are going to have our coffee break with uh, some cake and fruit. I think all of you probably saw our dining area already, which is to that side uh, behind the forum. Um, and then we are going to divide into workshops. After our keynote speech, we're going to have time to introduce the workshops to you in more detail, but you're going to have to choose each of uh, these, well, always one of these three options. And um, in the evening, we're going to have our panel discussion, and I hope that we will get together after that for some wine, beer, or soft drinks, uh, due to the beautiful weather, that should be fun. Um, and I have some organizational things to add. For this conference, as well as for the Global Health Summer School, we are being supported by Engagement Global with funds from the Federal Ministry, Ministry for International Cooperation of Germany. Um, we also are going to take photos and we are going to record, uh, especially the keynote speech and the panel. If um, any one of you would not like to appear in a photograph or be on the recording, please let us know. Anyone from the organizing team with the yellow badges can be approached for that. Um, we do have credits for physicians who practice here in Germany. You can enter your um, code at the registration. These are the Fortbildungspunkte. 
And I hope all of you have already registered and signed in, uh, so you're all shipshape. All right, and Felix is going to introduce our first speaker. Okay, so um, without further ado, then let's um, introduce to you our keynote speaker, which is Anne Grimmer Mahler. Um, yeah, Anne, we are happy to welcome you here again, I must say, because uh, last time you uh, visited us at the uh, um, symposium of Medico and the uh, German platform for global health, um, which I personally didn't attend because it was back in 2017. Um, I wasn't with Medico at that time. Um, Anna, you have a um, total PhD in development studies from the University of Oxford, and you are currently a uh, associate professor in international relations and deputy director of the Center for Global Health Policy at the University of Sussex in the UK. And recently, you worked on the role of pharmaceutical companies in global health governance, and as well on on health security in several African countries. Um, so, against the backdrop of your work, let me ask you, um, how has so-called global health security emerged in the last years? And um, yeah, what, in what way do the recent geopolitical power shifts reshape the international public health order? The floor speaks. <laughs> For inviting me again. Um, just to organize myself a little bit. So, while I'm doing this, um, I, yeah, I first wanted to, um, yeah, say thank you for, for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here again. Um, and uh, as uh, in, in a kind of side conversation earlier over a bit of lunch, I said, uh, plus ça change, plus ça reste la même chose. Um, a lot of things seem to have changed since I was here six years ago, uh, and uh, in many ways, not much seems to have changed. Um, something I'll um, talk a bit more about why I say this hopefully might become clear in, in my talk. Um, what I wanted to say is, uh, a couple of things about my background. So I did my PhD in development studies, but I think my training essentially is in political science and international relations. So I think that's important for you to understand how I'm coming to global health, how I'm coming to this conference. Um, obviously no medical training, um, um, but I think um, from my work in the last 10 years that actually political Analysis is quite important to understand uh, things that are happening in, in the global health field. Um, perhaps I was about to say more so now than ever, but that's actually, I don't think it's actually correct. It's always been important. So, um, I, when, when Miniko asked me to, um, to join another symposium six years ago, it was on the same topic. It was global health, uh, health security. And I felt that at that time, this, this very idea that certain health issues can pose threats to security was just sort of um, becoming more, more talked about, more well known at the, um, at the international level, certainly in Germany. I remember at that time or a year before that, I had a PhD student who was trying to do a PhD on global health security in Germany. And she couldn't find a supervisor here because nobody was actually working on this section, this nexus between health and security in Germany at the time. It was much more part of the public health discourse debate in the UK and in the US already at that time and had been for, for a while and that sort of was um, what I was working on. I think that since that time, global health security, or I think in German it's globale Gesundheitssicherung, has become quite a common term, and a lot of people um, talk about it. It's quite become quite entrenched. Um, 
And that is interesting to me, um, partly because of all the criticism that has been uh, voiced and articulated on, on this concept. So just um, some of the, some of the um, criticism um, um, I sort of just noted here, um, generally a criticism of what it does to our understanding of health if we look at it through the prism of security, um, that it focuses our attention on uh, actually a very small number of health issues, um, notably infectious diseases, um, especially those with pandemic potential, but it neglects a whole lot of other health issues. Um, also, that health, global health security essentially, despite the label global, fundamentally protects the interests um, of wealthy countries, notably in the West. And um, a third major criticism that um, global health security has a tendency to disregard <coughs> social determinants of health and, and with that also issues of, of inequality. Um, I think the experiences during COVID, in a way, uh, confirmed all those points. Um, but nevertheless, my impression at least is that despite the quite well articulated criticisms, despite COVID, if anything, the link between health and security is becoming more entrenched rather than less, um, or perhaps more deeply entrenched. Um, I want to share with you today some of my observations from um, the last few years of research on the process through, with, through which this entrenchment has happened, through, with, through which this nexus, this link between health, health and security has been, um, has been entrenched. And um, I'd be very interested in the course of today to hear your thoughts, to have conversations about what this process of entrenchment means for abilities or opportunities to influence uh, the way this, this is happening. I, as uh, Andrea said, I have very few answers, um, lots of questions, but um, perhaps as a starting point. The um, talk today is called After COVID Global Health Security in Africa. It's slightly different from the, what's in the program. Um, it took me a long time to find an angle into this talk, to find a way, like, how can I talk about global health security? Um, uh, what, what could be sort of my way into this? Because so much can be said, there's so many different dimensions and layers to this topic. And eventually I decided to um, talk about it quite a bit by, um, through focusing on how health security has happened in Africa. And I've chosen this um, for several reasons. All of these reasons have to do with perspective. Um, one um, is that my impression is that a lot of writing and reporting on global health security focuses on what happens at international organizations at the international level, what happens at WHO negotiations currently, the pandemic with the IHR revisions, the UN declarations, um, and for good reasons, it's important what happens there. But I wanted to shift the perspective a little bit on what happens elsewhere, because a lot happens elsewhere as well. Global health security doesn't just happen at the international, at the global level. And I think looking at what happens in other places can help us perhaps get some new insights into this um, topic. Uh, another reason why I chose this, this angle is um, a selfish one. I started a project on health security in Africa just before the pandemic started, so in 2017-18, and the project was cut short through the pandemic, but I want to keep, take it up again, and I'm hoping that this talk and conversations around it might help me sort of back into this. Um, and the third reason why I chose it, this angle, um, is that I think it might... We, we, sh we, might, we should perhaps challenge our ideas about what the role and the position of Africa is in global health security. My impression has been that um, Africa is often perceived as the place 
where global health security is done, so where things um, are implemented. Um, it's almost a, um, a lot of the activities of global health security are happening in Africa, are happening almost to Africa. Um, when I started the project um, in 2017-18 with colleagues on health security in Africa, we were actually quite surprised to see that um, it was a time when the health security idea seemed to take roots in Africa. Um, and that there, there was actually a lot happening, um, a lot of health security initiatives were coming out of African organizations, and that was a moment of change. Um, so that's sort of um, my starting point, really, for the talk. Um, this is just a slide with a very quick overview of some of the organizations that are um, African organizations that have been founded in the last 10 years, roughly, and who ha are um, doing a lot of initiatives on health security. Um, at the center is the Africa CBC. Sorry, you can't actually see it. Um, the Africa CDC, um, many of you might have heard um, uh, reports about the Africa CDC during COVID, um, a lot of information about how the COVID pandemic was playing out in Africa came out of the Africa CDC. Um, but there are others as well, uh, Affinet is a, a field epidemiology um, organization um, and there are increasing number of national CDC-like organizations, um, and the Nigerian CDC is the logo here, and then the Ethiopian one, several others have emerged. Um, so there's a whole landscape of African organizations now that are working on, on health security, which for us when we started the project was a surprise. Um, so before um, talking more about Africa, I want to have a brief step back in history um, and uh, talk about where actually the idea that certain health issues are potential, um, constitute potential threats to security, where this idea comes from. Um, this is partly in response to Felix's question, um, partly it is because I'm not sure to what extent actually you guys are familiar with this idea of global health security, where it comes from, but it's also Thinking about where it comes from is part of the story that I want to, to tell here today. So, um, the idea that, that there are certain health issues which can threaten national security uh, is an idea that has a very particular historical context. And I think, being a political scientist, uh, I think this context is important to understand. Um, you have to um, think back to the 1990s, you have to think back to the end of the Cold War, um, and you have to put yourself in the position of someone, policymaker you know, in the United States. So the idea that certain health issues pose threats to security was born in the United States after the end of the Cold War. Um, the the um, sort of the emergence of this idea um, became manifest uh, first in the in language that health was talked about in the context of words like security, but it became perhaps more importantly manifest in in who was sitting at the table um, where certain health issues were discussed, notably infectious diseases, because you could see that in the 1990s in the U.S. Um, certain health issues, infectious diseases, um, were increasingly discussed in the presence and with uh, contributions from members of the foreign policy and security community in the United States. So the people who were talking about infectious disease threats were not just people from the health community, but people from the foreign policy and defense and security community. And this um, report here that I put on the slide um, is one of the manifestations. If you look at the author of this report, it's, it's actually it's the National Intelligence Council. So that's the highest uh, um, advisory body to the to the president on uh, security uh, questions. And uh, this report was all about health threats and how certain health issues pose threats to the national security of the United States. 
Um, this happened, this shift in perspective on health happened against the background of the end of the Cold War, where the main enemy of the United States, the Soviet Union, had disappeared. And the security community was trying to think about what do we mean by security in this new context. Um, one of the issues that arose on that agenda were um, that in the 1980s, um, more, uh, quite a few more um, infectious disease pathogens had been discovered. Um, HIV AIDS had, was sort of starting, um, Ebola had been uh, discovered, and um, it was also discovered that some, um, some pathogens that were known had become resistant to existing drugs, tuberculosis for instance. So there was this, this was sort of against the background. Um, Another important um, background to understand here is that the 1990s, late 80s, 1990s, was the, was the era of the beginning globaliza globalization. Um, so all of a sudden, um, or not all of a sudden, but the United States in particular was um, very exposed to the rest of the world through um, incredibly steep a rise of trade, um, of people people moving around the world, and also through um, their military, because the United States had military um, bases in most places in, in, in the world. So the, the, the context of this idea of health and security being linked is in the context of the United States being the country that was most exposed to globalization at the time, through trade, through people traveling, and through military, it's the military um, strategy of being present everywhere. Um, another context to keep in mind is that the 1980s and 1990s were an era of incredibly rapid progress in the sciences, specifically in the bio, um, biomedical sciences, but also data computer sciences. Uh, the 1980s was really the age of biotechnology where um, that, um, that sort of uh, area of knowledge was taking off and with it the ability to manipulate um, um, pathogens um, for um, beneficial purposes or for, uh, for threatening purposes. And an issue that the United States was um, particularly concerned about in the 1990s was the rise or the potential of bioterrorism. Um, the scientific advancements played a big role here, but also that with the end of the or with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the largest bioweapons programs in the world, apart from the US, had also collapsed, and it wasn't clear where the technology and knowledge from that program had had uh, had gone to, and who might be able to use some of this knowledge for. Um, for violent attacks on the United States. Um, there was an attack on the Tokyo underground in 1995 um, with sarin gas, which very much sort of heightened these fears in among the um, US um, that terrorists could use um, bio biological or chemical uh, substances to commit acts of terrorism. So, I'm just saying all these things which seem to be quite unrelated to what's happening today in global health, but to give you a, a, um, an idea of how important it is to understand the particular context in which certain ideas emerge and, and, and sort of make their, their own life. And the, uh, the idea of health security really comes from this context. It very much comes from the perspective of foreign and security concerns in the United States at that time. Now, what does the United States do about it? Um, the um, main responses were uh, an investment um, in um, disease surveillance, in laboratory networks to detect outbreaks, identify pathogens, but also uh, laboratories um, and that could sort of help develop um, medical countermeasures, so medicines and vaccines against those those threats, um, and also um, develop uh, computer systems, information systems to build uh, reporting structures to, to prepare, to, to basically um, 
detect and, uh, and respond to threats when they emerge. A lot of this work uh, was done out of the CDC, the US CDC, the US Centers for, for Disease Control, um, but quite a bit also um, came uh, with a lot of involvement from the defense and military community, especially the program um, on developing what they, the United States then called medical countermeasures. So developing medicines and vaccines and diagnostics that could be used in the event of a, of a threat. Um, the problem with these pharmaceuticals and diagnostics, or specifically the pharmaceuticals, is that it's very hard to develop them because you actually have, you don't know what you're working towards. You don't know which pathogens will pose the threat, which makes it very hard to, um, not only to prioritize your research, but also to think about how to approve um, and develop those drugs because you have nobody to test them on. Um, you can't infect patients with um, a pathogen that you think might be used in the future. So it, is a, it was a big project um, to uh, think about regulatory structures, to think about funding, and importantly to get pharmaceutical companies on board to do this work because for pharmaceutical companies as commercial entities this is not an interesting area to work in. There's no big market. Here. But the United States put several billions of dollars into developing um, what they call the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasure Enterprise. Um, and the agency in charge of this is BARDA. The reason I mention this is that if you look at today at organizations like CEPI, uh, you see quite a lot of similarities uh, in the way that they are designed and what they do. Um, mapped onto those policy and institutional structures that were developed in the United States in the, uh, at, at that time. So all this work I just described was happening nationally, but very quickly in the late 1990s, early 2000s, the US realized that in order to um, respond to these new security threats, they had to go international. And the big project was to push the, the idea that certain health issues are security threats, to push this idea onto the international political agenda. Um, a lead agency here was, again, the US CDC. Um, the US CDC has offices in many countries around the world, is often, or in my experience, very highly regarded, has a lot of influence. Um, in the pub local public health communities. And the UNCDC took on or was tasked with promoting the idea of health security, global health security across the world. In addition, the USCDC also hosts an international program called the Global Health Security Agenda, which comes with a lot of influence from US foreign policy, which essentially brings together, I think, about 60 countries now to work on improving global health security especially by implementing disease surveillance, laboratory networks, and reporting structures in countries around the world. In, in addition to this uh, work, which runs a lot out of the US CDC, the US also pushed for uh, health security to be an international political issue through their diplomatic core, of course, embassies everywhere, um, uh, representations of international organizations. Um, but also the United States has military advisors in most countries of the world, also security advisors to regional organizations like the EU, African Union. And they are basically were promoting the idea um, that certain health issues pose threats to security in security fora around the world. So, it is basically a, a concerted effort on the part of many parts of the US government to spread the idea that health uh, poses, uh, certain health issues pose threats to security. This again happens in a context, so we are now in the early 2000s. Um, and again, if you cast your mind back to, to that time, um, Globalization really has become the master concept of the time. It's the word, the idea that everyone's talking about. Everything is now global. We talk about all kinds of global challenges. We talk about global governance. Um, so the idea of globality has finally arrived. And many more countries are now also exposed 
and participating in globalization. In the 80s and 90s, it really was the share of US companies on glo in globalization was vastly exceeding that of most other countries. In the early 2000s, that has changed. Many more countries now have uh, their national economies integrated into international um, economic structures as well. Um, so there is a there is a um, kind of it's a fertile ground on which the US promotes the idea that there is something like global health security. Um, also, and a very important event was the outbreak of SARS, SARS-1, um, in 2003 um, in, um, in Asia, which um, didn't actually result in a long period um, of uh, pandemic, or it didn't, uh, didn't sort of take hold, but it did spread a lot of fear. Um, for those of you who were sort of around then, or, or remember that time, um, it, um, SARS was um, yeah was uh, was a was a big thing, and especially for countries in Asia. Um, so what I'm saying is you have, and that's also perhaps not to be forgotten, you have the only remaining superpower pushing an issue onto the international agenda, but you also have a very receptive context. You have a lot of you have things happening that make it easier for countries, organizations, to absorb the idea that health and security are linked. So what you're seeing in the, in the early 2000s is really the idea that global health security is a thing being absorbed and being institutionalized in international organizations. The WHO um, um, takes on this issue for the first time in 2007 in their annual report uh, a day for future, adopting the idea of global health security. We see the emergence of uh, instruments like joint and, um, external evaluations on the back of revising the international health uh, regulations. The international health regulations are a treaty to uh, improve outbreak reporting um, internationally. Um, these, this treaty is revised in 2005 as part of the or influenced by the global health security idea, and an instrument is developed, the GEE, Joint External Evaluation, which basically tries to monitor that countries, especially in the global south, are actually implementing survey, disease surveillance, lab networks, reporting. Um, you also see new organizations being founded, like CEPI, um, and uh, the R&D blueprint in WHO. So you really see an international, or institutions, policies being developed in international organizations that make global health security a, a real thing, uh, um, and basically entrench it in the, uh, on the international political agenda. But also, and that's one of the uh, things I would, one of the messages I want to get across here, with health security, making the move from the national context in the US to the international political system, things change. Um, the US is incredibly powerful, especially at that time in international politics, but obviously a lot less powerful than, than in the national uh, context. So the moment you have the issue of global health security at the international political level, it encounters a new set of interests, a new set of ideas, many more people being involved in the debate. Um, so the idea of health security now encounters um, other different ideas of what security actually means, going back to your question, uh, Katya, earlier. Um, when we hear security, we kind of all, mean, all know what we kind of mean, but if we really think about what what security means, we probably come up with quite different um, ideas depending where you are in life, where you are in the world, uh, what sort of situation you are in. Um, people can have quite different ideas about security. When the United States talked about health security in the 1990s, it was very clearly national security, military security, economic security of the American people. When we are having that debate at the international level, there are different ideas of security that are being articulated. 
Um, you have um, countries from the global south uh, having very different ideas of what threatens their security compared to what happened, threatens the security of the United States. Um, even when you talk about this in the context of health, um, countries in the global south don't think particularly bioterrorism is a, is a big problem for them. Um, health, the health of many people in the global south is threatened by other health issues and therefore also the economy of, um, of, of, uh, of these countries. But also the UN development um, program, UNDP, comes up with a new definition of security at the time. I think it was in 1994 or 5, UNDP published a report, um, and that report developed this concept of human security which essentially argues that after the end of the Cold War, we need to think about security not as something that is about the state, it's not about protecting the state, but it's about protecting the individual. And that idea of human security pays attention to health, to the environment, to food, so food security. So, bottom line, the idea of what health security means, which security, whose security is to be protected, is now a bit more up for discussion that, it, that, this, that this issue moved in the, into the international agenda. Also, a lot of global health security work at the international level is funded through ministries and agencies of international development. So the money that actually funds a lot of these activities comes out of parts of the government that are not primarily interested in health or security, but in development. So again, you have a new influence of how do we negotiate what health security, global health security is and what it means. And you have a massive debate about access to medicines uh, at the international level at the time in the context of the HIV pandemic, which also bumps into the new global health security agenda. So I'm not saying that all these influences radically changed what, what health security means, but it definitely um, shifted the debate and open space for people to engage with global health security in a way that was not possible uh, at the national level in, in the US. Um, even at organizations like CEPI, you have to engage with issues of access to medicines today um, um, if you talk about developing medical countermeasures. Um, it's not a discussion you would have at the, in, the US, in the US at the, at the national level. So, what I'm um, saying is now that in the last few years, we are seeing yet another shift where health security is moving context. And, um, and I think that's something that we could pay a bit more attention to, which might provide some interesting insights. So, what I'm, um, my, my impression from starting this research on health security in Africa is that health security is becoming entrenched in Africa, becoming appropriated by parts of African governments and organizations. But with, with that happening, it again encounters new ideas about, different ideas about security, different ideas about development, um, and a host of other changes, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. Um, quick step back, when I did, uh, before, when I did, I did some research in Africa many, many years back, and at that time, um, my impression was, and I think that's also you can read about this um, in, in research, that the idea of health security, global health security, until quite recently, it was considered a foreign agenda very much by most um, African policymakers, the public health community, something that was pushed onto African governments and organizations through donors which was about donor interests. Uh, it was a donor and an external agenda. Um, the shift now is, I think, that this perspective is changing and it is becoming something that it becomes a more domestic, regional uh, agenda. A big catalyst for this change was the outbreak of um, Ebola in 2015-16 in West Africa, 14-15, uh, um, which um, once again, for from the perspective of many people, 
um, I spoke to um, in West Africa really highlighted that global health security was not global at all. Um, it was a huge, um, that, that was actually one of very, um, I remember very, very vividly those conversations where people, and that was 2017, 18, were still like so angry about the res international response to the Ebola outbreak and felt that this was showing how global health security was really not uh, about protecting uh, interests and just there, and the conclusions that people reached, at least the pin side, um, was that Africa had to really create its own health security agenda, had to look after their own health security, because clearly the global health security agenda wasn't working for them. So, In this, um, what I've spent the last few um, minutes of the talk talking you through is where I see um, the shift in context in our health security being appropriate in Africa, what issues it is encountering, what ideas, what dynamics, and perhaps that as a basis for further discussions, what does that mean perhaps for people who want to influence the agenda or for future development. The first, um, the first is the issue of political legitimacy. As I said before, global health security was perceived, and still is perceived, I think, by many African policymakers and um, people working in that space as a foreign agenda. The work that is coming out of the Africa CDC, or the Africa CDC itself, and other organizations around it, um, in interviews and publications around this, um, I was surprised by the emphasis that um, people place on these being African organizations, that these being organizations that are legitimated through African political systems, African heads of state, government, and African organizations, and not um, through donors, or even, and that was a surprise to me, even through outsiders, and quote here, outsiders like w not WHO. I was really surprised by how many people we spoke to who uh, considered WHO as, a, as an outside organization, as an organization like other parts of the UN that Africa did not have a stake in, that was not owned in any way by Africa. From, I've always thought of the UN as something that I felt the countries I lived in were part of, and I was surprised by how much how many people I met who didn't feel that. So the issue of the Africa CDC being an African organization was very important. And African organization here means Africa CDC and some other organizations as well are part of the African Union. This is the headquarters in Addis Ababa. So it's a regional, continental, political organization in Africa. And the Africa CDC is part of this. Um, the, if you look through documentation from the Africa CDC, but also other organizations, you see that how often and how many times in documents, but also in conversations, people emphasize and refer back to African heads of state having given the mandate for these, operate, for these organizations to work on African health security. So that was uh, a very strong uh, rhetoric. Now, one might be a bit skeptical um, about how important rhetoric is, um, but my impression was that that it actually that it did, does matter. A second contextual factor that is quite important here is um, that we see now again back to politics um, in the last 10-15 years an increasing momentum in Africa and uh, to push for more continental integration, economic but also political. So the African Union is pushing very hard to develop institutions and policies to promote um, development and uh, economic industrial policies uh, across the continent to get African countries to cooperate more. Um, in this context, they developed um, a, a development agenda called um, Agenda 2063, 
um, with the subtitle The Africa We Want, which is essentially let's say, laying out social and uh, economic development for Africa. Um, and again, the, and one of the key sort of phrases in this document is African solutions for African problems. And if you look at documentations from these public health organizations that I listed earlier, you can see the same language coming up everywhere. The Africa we want, African solutions for African problems. So it's a, there is sort of, um, again, another kind of set of norms um, and legitimacy that is being, within which health security is contextualized, which is not about global, which is not, uh, um, yeah, which is about, about Af African um, ownership. Again, one can, uh, it's probably good to be a bit skeptical about how much language words actually mean, Coming from my research background, I actually do place quite a lot of emphasis on it, but even if one is a bit skeptical, another level of continental integration is quite material, and this is push for more economic integration. The African Union has um, signed, many African countries have now ratified the African Free Trade uh, Agreement, so essentially the idea of creating um, a, a free trade uh, area that allows for markets to become bigger. And as part of this push for economic integration, one of the pillars of this is to strengthen Africa's bioeconomy. Um, to build African pharmaceutical companies, but also um, other areas um, of the bioeconomy. This is quite relevant if you think about what health security actually does in terms of activities. Building labs, training scientists, building information and communications infrastructure, investing in genomics. These are all things you need if you want to build a bioeconomy. So for African policymakers not working on health, but working on the economy, on trade, on industrial policy, the health security agenda is actually quite interesting and attractive now because a lot of capacities that are being built for health security are also have a second use for building a bioeconomy. So that's another context in which sort of the health security agenda is now um, being entangled with other political and economic interests. And again, um, you don't need to read this particularly, but these, these new norms, these new ideas about uh, what health security is in Africa, you can see in the documents of, from these organizations. This is uh, an executive summary of the annual report of, no, I think of the, um, of the strategy report of the Africa CDC. And you can, just in the opening sentence, you, can, you read health as a development issue impacts the economic and social security of countries and regions. Da, da, da. Then mentioning of Ebola, um, but then mentioning of non-communicable diseases, of injury and trauma, of uh, yellow fever and cholera. So, this is not the same language, these are not the same diseases that you would find uh, in a document of uh, uh, an international organization working on global health security. It's different diseases that are uh, emphasized and you would, um, and it's a different language that is, is being used. Perhaps the most um, clear a document or, or agenda that shows these shifts is um, the idea of a new public health order for Africa or Africa's health security. This is an idea that was coined by the Director General of the Africa CDC in 2017. Um, and it's essentially an agenda that pushes for a change not in public health but in public health order. So it very clearly calls out issues of political and social inequality and injustice. Um, the interesting thing is that this idea is now being everywhere. If you look at World Bank reports, you find it. If you look at reports from SEPI, you find it. The US government, the German government. So this idea that uh, there needs to be a new public health order for Africa, but sometimes even a sort of a general idea we need a new public health order, has been, is, has come back, has come, was developed in Africa, uh, by the African CDC, but it's now becoming part of the global health security discourse. Um, and it's worth looking at uh, how 
key ideas of what global health security is and how it's supposed to work are ch being challenged and changed in this discourse and over time. One issue that is, has been articulated in this uh, a new public health order idea from about 2018 is that Africa needs to be able to manufacture its own pharmaceuticals. Um, and that very clearly was a challenge and is a challenge to global health security and it's also one of the issues that is currently being debated uh, in the discussions in the pandemic accord and the political declaration. So the context um, um, uh, of health security has shifted when it arrived uh, in a new context, in, in this case in Africa. And also very briefly, we need to remember that the wider context within which we discuss health security is changing quite rapidly. Just to mention this very briefly, um, some publications, some discourses talk about a new scramble for Africa. The emphasis here is on Africa um, being home to uh, the largest, um, maybe some of the world's most popular places. It's uh, going to be, the, I think, the world's most populous places by 2050, which essentially, from an economic perspective, means enormous markets, enormous workforce. Um, this, in addition to a lot of natural resources being found in Africa that, I, that we need for laptops, for electric cars, for, for, for uh, mobile phones, etc. <coughs> Um, makes Africa, again, a very interesting place to look at from an, from an economic perspective. And um, we already see, have seen in the last few years increasing competition between large powers um, to be able to access those markets and resources. This in turn um, is helping African governments and the African Union to strengthen their international political bargaining power to represent their interests. Um, and one of the, uh, the, um, the examples of an increased voice for the African Union for African governments was just a few weeks ago um, when the African Union was allowed or was admitted to become a full member of the G20 International Forum. Um, this sort of going back to what I said initially, I'm thinking about we might we need to rethink the position of Africa in global health security. Um, I think there is um, potentially increased political influence of Africa, African Union in international politics. Um, also, if you think about how the wider geopolitical situation in the world has changed from the time when health security was invented. Going back to another question Felix asked. In the 1990s, we had what we in international relations called the uni unipolar world. We had a world in which we had one superpower and that was the United States. All the large countries that we talk about today, China, Russia, Brazil, India, they were growing, but they were still very much considered developing countries. We live in a radically different world today. Um, we have probably two superpowers, but we have many large powers. And if you think about what that means for making international politics, for creating international agreements, you have a situation in which no one can dictate what is going to happen. But all large powers are trying to find allies to build coalitions around certain issues they want to push for. So there's a constant game of the US, people call it French shoring, so a constant game of finding allies and co building coalition uh, in international politics. And this again is an opportunity for middle powers like the African Union to negotiate, to get their interests into the agenda on a quid pro quo brain. We support you on this issue, you, you take up our interest on that issue. So that these sort of bargaining games are becoming more complex and perhaps um, shift the position of Africa in global health security debate. Finally, 
about that slide. Um, finally, there is a change in context which has to do with what's happening in the field of global health security. And that is what colleagues have termed the rise of emergency R&D. It's essentially the insight, the idea that you can develop medical countermeasures once an outbreak uh, is already happening. That was very much the lesson learned from the outbreak of Ebola in 2015, 14, 15, 16 that uh, vaccines could be developed, vaccine trials could be run in an outbreak situation. And this sort of created the ambition to do this better uh, for the future. This is sort of the idea of emergency R&D. So you can do pharmaceutical R&D in a any context of outbreak. And um, this idea is, is very much the back background to organizations like CEPI or the WHO uh, R&D blueprint. Um, but the problem is that if you want to do emergency R&D, you need um, to move the, or you need to create, you need to build an infrastructure that is diversified, that is local, because you need to have regulatory structures um, in the place where the outbreak occurs. You need to have clinical trial infrastructure where the outbreak uh, occurs. You need to have labor laboratory networks uh, locally. You need ideally to have um, manufacturing capacities locally so that you can um, produce um, the, um, the, the, the vaccines uh, that you want to trial. You don't want to ship all this back and forth, back and forth um, between where the outbreak occurs and then uh, um, Europe or, or, the, or the US. Um, and there's also the push for developing local stockpiles of candidates' vaccines uh, in many parts of the world. So bottom line, there's the idea that you can develop medical countermeasures or vaccines develop, um, and, and medicines during an outbreak has required a shift in thinking about how, what kind of infrastructure do we need to build. And the infrastructure that is needed is a local one, a diversified one. This again now shifts the position, the role of African governments in negotiating because um, that to allow such infrastructure to, to be built in, in a country is usually part of a, of a quick program in a nego negotiation game. And it changes the, the way that local interests can make it into political negotiations. Um, lots more to be said on this, I'll stop here. But um, <coughs> what I essentially want to uh, conclude with is the idea that health security has um, has been changing and evolving over a long time. And a lot of those changes have had to do with the idea and the practices that make it happen changing context. And um, I don't want to exaggerate the um, the impact or the, how radical those shifts and changes are. There are power structures uh, that remain very stable and have remained very stable, like, um, for example, who owns and controls much of scientific knowledge and associated technologies, the distribution of wealth in the world. Those power structures have remained very stable and have a huge influence. But I do think that we see incremental shifts and changes in health security, global health security, and I do think that those shifts and changes offer opportunities for influence. Um, and this is perhaps something then to take forward here in discussions. Very briefly, uh, as an example, coming back oops, not to this, but to this idea that we need local manufacturing of medicines and vaccines in Africa. This idea has been around for a long time, um, but it's never really gone, gained any traction internationally. The argument was always, it's not efficient, the markets in Africa are too small, um, it's too costly, 
the scientific and technological know-how is not there, so there's no point. Um, recently, um, during the COVID, um, the aftermath of COVID, the African Union has um, come up with a plan um, to manufacture, I think, 60% mm -hmm. of Africa's routine vaccination in Africa by 2014. Again, plans like this we've seen before. Um, there's an African pharmaceutical manufacturing plan from 2005, gone nowhere. What is interesting to me is not that the African Union has created yet another plan for pharmaceutical manufacturing in Africa. What is interesting to me is that everyone loves this idea now. This is really new. Um, you look at, WHO has always been in, in, in corners quite supportive, but we see the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation thinking it's brilliant. The Wellcome Trust, um, PEPFAR, Gavi, CEPI, um, all of them coming out not only with supportive statements, but actually creating um, budgets, making money available for uh, to support this idea. So this for me is one of those, again, I'm not being naive about it, there are strings attached um, and all that, but it is a change and I think um, it, is a, it is a change that is to be taken seriously and where opportunities may lie to understand where this change come from and perhaps how it can be moved in different directions. I think we need to understand the background to health security, how health security has been changing over time. I hope this all made sense. I'm really curious to hear some questions and thank you for listening. So this is hoping, hoping that it works. And uh, I hope we can bring this to a good end sometimes. And I, 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 I hope everybody got enough food. I was a bit worried that you will have maybe some of you have seen this, but I was worried that everybody would get food. But finally, everybody was uh, getting something. So I, I'm really relieved and I uh, apologize for any inconvenience that this might have happened. So that, that I got a bit. Yes. But now, now we are we are fed. We are, yeah. And let's let's start with a very final round. And I would like you you have seen it on our panel discussion. How to move forward? What are live alternatives? And what are shared utopias? These are the big big questions that uh, looks us forward. And I would like to start this asking my panelists. You have seen them, I don't need to introduce you again. I think Remco van der Pass here, ah, yeah, they were all introduced. So, Anus Vilashan and uh, Anna Romamala. And I would like to ask all of you three what you brought, or uh, what, you, what you have heard during the workshops, during the day, in talks with the participants. Um, that would answer some of this question. How to move forward? What, what were, or what, what kind of kind of uh, experience you would bring from this day, starting with this day, into our discussion? How to move on from here? So that's that's what I would like to ask all of you. And someone is starting. Who wants to start? Frank starts. Uh, thanks. Yeah. 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 Yes. The, um, thanks also for um, engaging with this discussion about ego, post growth, and, and healthcare. Also to um, to keep it to the end, but to provide some ideas on how to what what it would look like, uh, and more important than also how to take it forward. The most important thing that I took from that, uh, uh, from that workshop is that we do already have a lot of ideas how it should look like. Okay? It's not that we need to really reimagine re how healthcare should function. If we would like to have basic primary healthcare and health promotion into communities, etc. linked also with social cultural practices that make sense for people, uh, including maybe doing other ways of 
biomass and then the rest of it. And so it's not that we necessarily, um, let's say, have to redesign that. It's really to think about why we're not doing that in the first place. And that really has to do with how we structure our society, how indeed in neoliberal globalization, these capitalist forces and bureaucratic structures force us to do what we're doing things. And the next step is really to find alternative pathways. I think this is what this, yeah, what is this discussion is uh, is about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can everyone hear? Okay. Um, it's it's been a fascinating day, um, uh, and there's just so much to learn. Also, from across the um, the areas that have been discussed. Um, I think this is, I, I, I certainly don't have the answers uh, for the shared utopias, and, but there's certainly what I would echo what Remco is saying, that we, we, we know the, the problems and um, there are also alternatives. There are alternatives that are um, being um, implemented at a very sort of localized level, but some that are um, at a much sort of international scale. Um, I, I feel just having gone through, and of course I, I was limited in what I could capture because of the structure of the program. I attended 33% of the, the enriching discussions in, uh, in the two parallel workshops. But a common thread is really the um, the overwhelming and uh, the dominance of the security framing in health. And um, it's quite distinct from uh, security framing that we were at the within people's health movement uh, would, would talk about in the context of food security and in the kind of, uh, in, the, in, in that, um, the idea of, of health as a, as a common good. And I think, what is now, what we're seeing is that there are multiple levels at which uh, the security framing has completely changed. And the, the notion of crisis is being redefined from those multiple standpoints. So I think for us, one of the tasks is that we also do not take on these established concepts and terminologies without questioning and interrogating them. So when we, we, we just pick up uh, ideas around migration crisis and um, uh, the sort of pandemic as a, as a crisis, we, we really unpack what crisis for who and what sort of assumptions, what discursive framings are defining that crisis. So for me, that's one big takeaway. And I think we are talking a lot about these are different alternatives, a different way of imagining uh, the eco, for example, discussions. Uh, what we really need a follow-up conference is just learning from these uh, different alternatives. And just from that, and, I mean, I'll come to some specific examples that um, I have seen through MEDACT and the People's Health Movement and others. But we need to um, transfer these, disseminate these in the same, uh, with the same sort of uh, strength and evidence uh, in order to counter and resist uh, the hegemonic trends that we are seeing today uh, in health. Um, I'll stop there. Um, yeah, thank you also for me for, um, for coming and listening and participating. I also learned a lot um, and uh, I was actually a bit overwhelmed by the different, different perspectives that people brought to these discussions. Um, I felt like there were certain ideas that most people would agree on, um, sort of more human-centered understanding of security, um, the importance of inequality, but then also a lot of questions around what some of the words and terminology that's used mean. For example, what actually does preparedness mean? When is one prepared? Um, does it make a difference? Can you be prepared? Um, perhaps on the back of also what you said, Anish, um, for me, I think from today, but also previous discussions, I'm less and less sure about this notion of the global and 
how that helps us further. I mean, there are obviously areas and aspects of, of health that are tied into global processes, um, international, transnational processes, but I feel that a lot of the um, way that people respond is very much grounded in very local perceptions of, of health and therefore a greater attention to those alternatives, approaches that exist and are developed in different parts uh, um, are, would be important. So, yeah, stepping back from the notion of the global and global health security for me would be one important way for me to start thinking slightly differently about, about um, these questions and issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, so, the maybe sets the scene for a second, or maybe maybe let's also talk from me what, what I would have seen and heard uh, during the, the workshops. Uh, I probably also was very impressed by this, what we always say that, that, uh, that also health security or the, the health uh, uh, must start from the community level and how this is, is in practice possible to, to engage much stronger than relying only on the, on the state level um, services. And I think this workshop with, uh, with our Hamburg friends from the polyclinic gave us was something that, that seems to be, it was seemingly a very, very, um, very easy answers to how they organized themselves in the pandemic and how they managed in, in their quarter, in their neighborhood uh, to organize um, also the vaccination campaign. But it became very clear that this is only working in a way when it is group, uh, rooted and grounded in, where in, an, in a community approach that really takes the experiences of people serious and just beyond also their health uh, needs. And this is something that, that was, I found quite inspiring. This doesn't answer the question in how to move forward with the global discourses and concepts that, uh, that global health security is discussing. But I, I would insist that this is something, an inspiring moment that uh, also those of you who have been in the workshop maybe have felt but uh, which was also part of what what uh, Remco um, of what we did as a as a group here in the workshop with Remco and uh, so in that way I maybe also have a second set of question if you or if you want to uh, respond to to the other panelists or you want to keep in mind um, what are the allies that we are looking for these um, new push for towards um, a different way of looking into um, global health security which <laughs> is not reduced to um, to this technically techni technical uh, security and uh, concepts maybe we start again yeah. Yeah. that's uh, that's it Good question. And what I find, I just go a little bit also um, over time back to, so some of us have been involved in the, uh, the people's health movement linked to the, to the original social justice movement coming from, let's say, the anti-globalization uh, movement vis-a-vis -vis the World Trade Organization, etc. I'm quite intrigued, why didn't it work out? Why, have, why has our movement building not functioned over the last 20, 30 years? So it's also a lot of people from Egypt, the Enveo, from the peace movement. So why, are we, why have we not really confronted uh, this neoliberal globalization with its inequities and, and ecological implosion that we're, that we're seeing now? That's an also, a, it's, a, it's an academic question, but also very much a social political. So what did we do wrong? That's my, um, uh, that's I try to understand. And it's partly for me because there is so much, um, uh, there, is so, there is so much promise that within the current system we can make it work. This is the, 
um, the, this is the marketing and the hope from sustainable development goals from the World Health Summit that we make it possible from the Gates Foundation that is making vaccines etc available by the World Health Organization etc there is a very strong uh, cultural uh, and, and media and digital media presence that say you know we will be we will be fine we will be all right we will be resilient we will be able to to sustain as long as we are building back better and then we make it happen and that um, so we are in a little bit pacified it's like a, it's like a, um, a pacifier that that we that we are provided from in, in that we're able to deal with these multiple crises and the real alternatives that exist and also some of you have been involved in what we don't realize and I think where we could have much more solidarity is with those human rights defenders ecological rights defenders in many places that have been killed all those journalists there have been people literally silenced and we don't see them so there's a lot of voices not in that room and we need to Give, we need to we need to bring them back or try to uh, um, try to find it. Just to give an example, eh? today is one it's one year after the Iranian Revolution. How is is our community willing to uh, support the Jin Yadi Azadi uh, uh, cause? Eh? And but that's why how we get the least in global health or planetary health. We're quite dissatisfied with our own internal discussions. So I think now it's really time to find uh, alliances, but that's risky. It's political risky. It's uh, it's um, it can be it can be violent, and this is. I think we are now at, the, at a quite a really an ideological time that we need to um, make choices. And also uh, really hard. Um, I guess from I get to where to find allies. I guess I'm quite coming back to my my work on health security in, in Africa. I'm um, I would be interested to understand. I'm interested to understand better the the communities and organisations that are becoming interested in this space um, in Africa and. Um, not necessarily be um, what's the word um, sort of deterred from the, 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 the language of health security, um, but trying to better understand the interests and the perceptions of security and, and health and public health that they are coming from, and trying to yeah see whether coalitions and allies can be formed here. Um, even if this, yeah, um, I think, yeah, a really a curiosity of how this agenda is being taken up elsewhere and looking for opportunities to engage with those perceptions, perspectives, uh, and look for opportunities for, for um, working together and, and, and shaping the, even though the label is still that of health security, but I think. It could be interesting to understand better what, what's behind those those groups and those those ideas. It's a really tough question at this hour um, to, to answer, and I feel and, and this is a general, this is a really important question uh, and for where why are we in this state? Why uh, despite and why are we in the state talking about the same things since 19, early, <laughs> late 78? And despite sort of um, activism, despite movements, uh, despite um, small successes, why we really continue to fail? One, of course, is the external forces uh, and, um, and, and how hegemonically entrenched they are. But the second, I feel, is also that we have given in to um, and not resisted hard enough to the ways in which market and the state have created factions and divisions uh, amongst us. We've also fallen prey to the very projectized, very managerialized approaches, not um, 
building synergies even within and across the, the movements. We know our allies, but we do not have enough time to work with the allies and um, follow the same um, same cause, learn from the experiences in one country, and also listen. Uh, and I think that this comes back to a discussion that we were having um, during the post growth um, and the degrowth uh, uh, workshop that um, we've not questioned enough from who is speaking on whose behalf. And this is a problem that uh, we as progressive movements also face. Uh, we've been very siloed in our approach, despite, I mean, being a very proud PHL member, it took PHL to several years to recognize the gender uh, justice, gender inequality struggles. Um, we are united uh, in our struggles, but not in our approach. And I think that's what we need to do, that build these synergies across these different struggles and efforts. Now there is a lot of discussion about there's no climate justice without gender justice or vice versa. But how have these different movements come together? What are the shared causes that we can pursue together and uh, learn and build uh, these, these synergies and work on the progressive path? So I think the, the solutions are there, uh, but I think our approach to uh, implementing those solutions, somewhere we lost track, and I think we need to come back uh, to that. Uh, but I am, I'm, I'm still hopeful, I'm especially hopeful for uh, this very um, vibrant and young audience in, uh, that we have had today, who shared tons of experience and, and examples and asked the right questions. So the question to be asked when we talk about deco debate is who is informing and who is uh, heading this debate? What kinds of voices are getting missed uh, in the discussions uh, around degrowth? Uh, from what standpoint are people talking about degrowth uh, and, de and, and a more egalitarian world? What are the standpoints? What are the privileges? What are the uh, oppressions uh, that uh, uh, these voices represent? And I think that we need to just do a little bit more soul searching as movements from where we have failed. That's all. Thank you. And I, I think it's enough that what we had on the stage already. So please, uh, this is the microphone. Uh, come up with your own reflections, suggestions, commitments. What uh, what you what you heard today what will resonate with you in the next time, in the next week, when half of you will be in the Global Hub Summer School, or the others when they go home. Um, I actually wanted to uh, add something to what was said in the last round, because when we talk about allies, I think, I, I love spaces like this a lot, and it's really interesting conversations, but I know when I go back into my real life, I meet a lot of people who cannot even connect to the words I'm using, and why in the context of allies we never address, for example, our own population in Germany, because who is addressing, for example, the German population? It's most often different ideas, different contexts we maybe don't want, but when we look at our community, I never see it represented in a mainstream, understandable language for a I don't want to use the term all people, but I'm lacking words, I'm sorry. Um, so what is your idea, your opinion about that? Do we do enough to actually talk to the people who are supposed to do the change we need? Who else? Yeah, I think let's collect a few statements. so much for the talk. I am follow it. I'm a political scientist and student of international relations and I'm Professor for Anne Mama. You said in the first round that uh, you are now kind of distancing yourself from the term global health or kind of rethinking it. And I'm wondering if, it, if this is not kind of depoliticizing the term because yes, global health is a global phenomenon and developments that are happening, the pandemic just 
solar are interconnected and this is what falls on the local and also the living question. Is mis missing the point that it's all interconnected and often needs to be called to touch. So my question is kind of linking, I think, to both of uh, my asks. <laughs> um, it's maybe also pretty simple, but don't you think that a revolution basically is necessary? Because it's, we, we sit here and, and have interesting talks and thoughts, but in general, we are a very small group, and, and I mean, I'm kind of new to this uh, research area come from like more medical studies, but I feel like it's also a pretty, like internationally, it's still a small world of research that is being put in and a lot of single persons are doing a lot of work in that, but it's still not at the top notch and we're not like, we were uh, talking earlier about the big corporations and everything and they might do some panel discussions also, but just, you know, for uh, show off and stuff like that, but it's not really a pressuring topic to them at all. So, isn't it really necessary to first change the way politics are being made? And otherwise, we can sit here and have interesting thoughts and discussions and, and have a, a revolution at mind, but not at present. depoliticizing health, um, I, would, I would probably make the exact opposite case. I think the global label was doing a lot of depoliticization in terms of creating a narrative that certain health threats are a threat to everyone in the world. They are all affecting, affecting everyone. The, the idea of global challenges, global solutions. Um, I've and if, I mean, these, these towns, these labels go through phases and change meaning. And I've come to see them more, the term global, the label global, as more the cover up for what was essentially a very, a world with a very concentrated um, center of power. And um, the, the way that global was defined very much in. Uh, yeah, influenced by actually a very narrow perspective. So I'm currently moving, uh, that's of my, where I think actually it's, it, that, that the label global did a lot of depoliticization. Um, but it's open to debate and very happy to, to discuss further. Um, I skipped the question of evolution. Um, um, do we do enough? Um, no, never, I guess. Um, but I would also say, I'm also looking for where things have changed, rather than only looking for where things are not good enough and haven't progressed enough. And, um, and I think one thing that, one change that I have experienced actually in my professional career is how much more um, ideas from humanities, justice, ethics, um, social science are actually being discussed in the, um, in the medical community. I, I know a lot of medical schools now that actually have among their faculty social scientists, anthropologists. I know that um, 
public health institutions um, much more keen and also are in uh, hiring and working with um, with, with uh, people from 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 those kind of worlds. So I think perspectives on health actually have shifted quite a bit, and also in the education on health. And um, it's not enough. But I think if the only if I only well, if I speak to my fellows, but if I only look for stuff that isn't enough, I, I get depressed and too pessimistic. So I'm looking for things where things have changed, and I think we have also seen changes for the for the better. So I would just follow up on that, and I completely agree. I think the answer to the question isn't enough. Uh, what we're doing at the community level, and I think this is why uh, the far right, hyper nationalist, um, and fascist uh, organizations are better at us in doing, in connecting with the community, in packaging evidence, and packaging messages, um, in in uh, in ways. Uh, and packaging wrong evidence. So we know the infodemic that we have experienced with, with COVID. Uh, in, but still being able to connect with, um, with communities. Um, that said, I would say that wherever we, the community organizing and mobilizing and collectivist uh, initiatives have been introduced, they have been uh, very effective. Um, and um, but we also need to be aware. So for example, I'll give an example of the Page in Scotland uh, work that we were engaged in when we started with the whole participatory action uh, approach uh, to identifying the key priorities of communities of people through a range and series of methods that we adopted that led to a People's Health, Health Manifesto, which we adopted at one of the UK People's Health Assembly. And um, this was just around the time, and of course taking um, opportunity, identifying opportunities where these strategies are going to be most effective. So it was around the referendum that Scotland was uh, undergoing, and we did this by talking about what an independent Scotland should look like in health terms. How should people's health and independent Scotland be? And that led to the first health people's health manifesto. And that, that, that whole tradition of that continued. We had a public hearing on the social determinants of mental health, bringing together housing, uh, unemployment, and other aspects of uh, oppression and disadvantage that we are seeing in societies together um, to talk about inequities. Um, and the public hearing uh, had people who were experiencing these uh, multiple oppression and disadvantages growing up in a sort of a, a theater to talk about these testimonies. And this was done with um, the uh, Health Scotland at the time, with the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and a number of different um, statutory bodies as, as well. Uh, that, that tradition has continued, and uh, we recently had a second People's Health Manifesto reviewing that work and in five years' uh, time, and talking about what the demands and entitled, uh, what the rights are. We also lobbied uh, the uh, different part, political parties to take on that uh, the Health Rights Manifesto and uh, were successful in at least two of the mainstream parties uh, in how they ran with their uh, and incorporated this in the manifestos. There are multiple uh, community organizing initiatives that you know, people here can share about which have led to successes. But we're living in difficult times, as we talked about multiple crises. Um, people are, uh, and, and these collectives are fatigued. They're operating in very shrinking uh, spaces in terms of finances, in terms of human rights. Uh, and it's, it's not easy to sustain the momentum. So, but I would say um, more, in, more dialogue uh, is, is necessary. I also very quickly touch upon the point that you're talking about is offer, you know, uh, the idea of operating in silos. And I, unfortunately, while we, we need to build more synergies among like-minded and people who are of similar vision, but we really need to dialogue uh, with where the action is happening, where those these trends um, that we are resisting are happening. And they're happening at a massive scale. Uh, so we can talk about keeping our services public, 
but we are not in those corridors which where rampant privatization and the, the, uh, different governments and DFIs, etc., pumping in money for the private um, privatization of funds. And I think that those are the spaces where we also need to be. Uh, and adopt a range, a range of uh, different methods in, in uh, advocating for health justice. Yeah. Thank you. Branko, can or shall we take can another round? round? Okay. If there is another round, comments, colleagues, ask. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mwani Sungu. Uh, I come from Zambia. So uh, this is a question that I, I asked during one of the, the workshops, but it wasn't answered, so I'll, I'll ask the question again. Yes, yeah, so um, having lived through the pandemic as an African and as a Zambian, um, my comment is the pandemic exposed a lot of inadequacies with our health systems. For the most part, we were behind closed doors waiting for solutions from the West. And when solutions were made available uh, in the West, it took another six months to a year before uh, these solutions were made available to us. So uh, in line with uh, the keynote speech that was made in the morning, uh, do you think Africa is now ready for future pandemics? And if not, what recommendations do you have uh, for Africa, for us to be to be ready for the next pandemic, as opposed to having been uh, over reliant on uh, the West? Thank you. My name is Lutz Lutz Heide. I'm a pharmacist and I worked for five years in Africa. And I want to compliment a little bit of a different view of what the gentleman before me said. Um, we have talked a lot about the um, global health and the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think it's just worthwhile to remember that many health problems which have existed 25 years before the pandemic are still exactly there in the same way. Um, young children die in the global south of diarrhea. Um, mothers die in childbirth of postpartum hemorrhage. And these are very, very important uh, problems. Um, and talking about global health security may lead us to focus a little bit too much on the aspect of responding to the next pandemic. I think many more people suffer and die from diseases which are present there since many years and didn't change. So I think we should always consider both aspects here and not, obviously the rich people, um, the rich countries, are more threatened by pandemics. But many people in the global south die every day, suffer every day from very other diseases. Observations from today or from your work outside today? Okay, let me uh, try to heat up the. I, I've missed something today. I think something very crucial that we didn't talk about. I don't know to what extent it was addressed in other workshops. Um, but a very specific, which happened in front of our eyes, but we failed to grasp it, and that is the whole digitalization of our economy at the moment. Uh, the artificial intelligence, the whole, the whole network, so we are connected with the rest of the world. I really, when I look at my WhatsApp uh, list, I connect with people from 40 countries, maybe, easily, in different, in different groups. And many of the global health colleagues might do so as well. So we're very connected. We know all of it. We know the knowledge, we, we, we know our elites, we are connected with our elites daily. We do it uh, when we wake up, when we send a message. And, and I was interested 
part of part of this degrowth debate is because we're missing the, the physical, real, day-to-day -day action and maybe the revolution we're talking about. We know very much. We do a lot of rational analysis. Indeed, in our in our in our uh, university work and teaching, we know very well what to do. We write dozens of papers about it, um, but it does not change because it also leads to isolation. Somehow we're very much connected from the real physical revolution. It may be very. Um, so this is there is a one of the there's a. British professor called Tim Jackson, who wrote a lot about prosperity without growth, uh, um, life beyond capitalism. And for him, the revolution starts with care, um, because care is something that you cannot commodify because it's at the root of who we are. We care for each other as humans, as social beings. We reproduce and nurture, etc. And we have done that for thousands, ten thousands of years without having to rely on medical services or without having to be productive in a capitalist sense. So the, for him, he would argue, the revolution starts with day-to-day -day care and not to be worried or not that um, it's not being that you well that you that you fall out of a of a of a life or that you need to um, that you need to be anxious to buy something that you don't really need etc. So it, there is something very at the heart of providing care for each other and capturing that space. At least that's what they talk about. Common. There's also a feminist way of saying, look, we're stepping, we're organizing ourselves, and we're becoming autonomous in the way we do things, and even at a larger scale and. Like debates about what the uh, uh, Zapatistas were doing, or in uh, Boyava in, uh, in Kurdistan, that that is uh, that that they want to take back control of their of their living space outside outside the state that sets structures and outside also the market with all its demands for ever more production. <coughs> but that um, I can talk about it. But in the end, it's about doing things. And, and this is also maybe a call for us to really start to engage with. There are, there are quite some uh, communities and groups who are doing this here. The, the, the people from the, from the Polyclinic Syndicate from Vettel and, and what was presented from, from Turkey. It is, it is there, but it's maybe up for us also, and I'm thinking also for us being in the academic space, be more pra really practical there, and that we introduce that also in, um, yeah, in in practices, and also not being afraid then that you fall out of the labor market, or that you need to um, find a job which makes us all insecure and anxious, etc. Um, so it's it's that it is yeah stepping out, outside being anxious, but how that I live from my. Uh, for discussion at all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So the big questions are on the table in front of you. Any, anyone wants wants to put it? I, I as I also um, kind of maybe add to add to put a bit of salt and into a rough bit of salt into it. And I'm not so sure that that this care cannot be commodified. Uh, in a way, in a way, we have seen this in Germany. Like at least the practical care work for our elderly people uh, in Germany is very much in the hands of big financial institutions who have bought up uh, the, the institutional institutional old people's care in Germany. So this this is a worrying trend, and then we see that this is breaking down the minute these financial institutions cannot make profit out of it. That's what, what's happening right now. So, in that way, but still knowing um, that that this kind of caring for each other is, is of course, is a different modus operandi compared with the competitive way of living that capitalism uh, is is suggesting, which which uh, which is also the way we think about our how to how to get our jobs, how to get our stuff. 
uh, day by day. And, and in that way, I, I would encourage also to say, okay, let's grab, for example, the security word and turn it around and make this what, what we call social security, the security from or the absence of, of fear that in, into another practice of caring in a way that solidarity practice um, that could add to, to our um, yeah, becoming autonomous, becoming independent from, um, from these office of, an, of, a, of a system uh, particular what Anush uh, referred to, but what we see, of course, in, in Germany and, and all countries where, where um, right-wing repressive policy forces tend to to exploit or sort of sphere and and, and pull, put people against each other in uh, in the, the quest for securing resources for their own group for their own national group, for their own religious group, for their own um, whatever, whatever separate, separate existence. So, and, and, and to show that this is not necessarily the best way of living, uh, I think this is, is quite, quite, a, quite a challenge that, that we might want. And we want to be, uh, as you said, record today also, we are pessimists by intellect, <coughs> but optimists by will, so it is a, a kind of being and uh, uh, realizing optimism through the practice of this. And there's another comment. So, as far as I understand, we also have like practitioners in terms of yeah, policy and policy advice on, on the stage. And I would given the more theoretical discussion that we had and the um, insight that, okay, there's also action being done. I wanted to get some experience of you of how you approach policymakers who are often only susceptible to like marginal suggestions um, in, yeah, in basically communicating and persuading them of going with the more broader stuff. Monk, here at the front. Um, yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that I'm really, really hopeful from coming from this space, and I think there is a lot of interdisciplinary and engagement, and maybe some practical approaches that we can take from this. And having had this, these very theoretical discussions, but also some practical input, and maybe to add on to the two comments on global health security and how to try to solve or to counter them. I think that exactly the theoretical deliberations or the questions we start asking about like what, why are things the way they are, why is global health security the way it is, or why are we prepared enough, and is kind of a starting point to decenter these kind of um, yeah, uh, approaches that are presented to us and maybe from there build on how to think about um, alternative futures and solidarity where we can center practices um, of care or of um, solidarity um, approaches or find allies in different disciplines and in different fields. And in that regard, I find it really interesting to see that we are from so many different phases and fields and we come together here to talk about these things and then not just about global health security but then from there to ask <coughs> what Andreas just said what is missing from there what kind of securities or yeah um, other social questions can we ask and do we need to follow up on more comments it's uh, it's getting late, I feel, and I feel also this is a bit uh, the moment when uh, when we should have a last round of the panel and then uh, we close so that that we all can enjoy the evening. Um, or if there is any last, there is one more. <laughs> I 
really like the idea of pairing Temple introduced. Um, on the other side, um, I'm a bit more a realist, I think. Um, while I try to live exactly this idea, caring for not only the social interactions in my life, but maybe even for material, physical things in a sustainable manner, everything takes time and energy, which I'm then not spending in the capitalist system that, in the end, shows on a CV. Because everything I do in a caring way is not on my CV and who is going to employ me in what position. So if I do the right thing and want to do it, I'm punished for it. So then you have to talk about incentives. How do we incentivize the right behavior? So that's a good question for the last round. Who wants to answer that with you first? Because you were impressed already. I think that's a very important uh, question that you're raising. It's also raised to your soul that indeed care is commodified in, in many ways at this moment because we sit in our uh, health system through the political steering incentives indeed that make that uh, uh, possible. And that, that's connected to the policy advice. Um, so I work in a think tank, so I do policy advice. So my writings have to address to, to, uh, uh, to politicians. The, the thing is that to reclaim that space from a public good rights based, let's say feminist perspective that essential care, although it's not productive in a capitalist sense, need to be rewarded because it's a value in its own manner. Um, so it's Indeed, if it's no value in the labor market, but that it's still very valuable for society, that's, that's a political debate that in the current representative, in our current representative political democracy, is not being accounted for because it's very much focused on the state budgets and whether there's enough fiscal space and enough economic growth to keep the labor market going. So, Part of that work also goes outside, outside the, uh, the, the policy advice, and it goes into citizens' uh, uh, fora, into more direct democracy kind of uh, ways of um, asking for structures, universal basic services, care, uh, time banks, kind of uh, um, uh, subsidies, etc. To make, to make that happen. But for that we need a movement, but we're all very busy indeed doing the, doing the care and, and, and working overburdened in our healthcare structure that we can't reach there, uh, including in the, in the academia. And to, I think it starts a bit with resisting a lot of the bullshit and nonsense that is now there in our jobs, and maybe start striking and just doing the essentials and claiming space for the other part. And I'm really talking here to my, yeah, also, I'm, I, I have difficulty with, it's, it's, we need to find that out. And interestingly, the, the, there might be examples in other places of the world where that's already happening much more than here in our rationalized European efficient way of doing things. So that's where the connection, it's what really learning from each other from different places. Um, and that's where, that's where my hope comes from, that that's absolutely, possible, but we need to start finding locally and at a high level people who are willing to do that with us. And today was a good movement and start for that. <laughs> who wants? Oh, okay. Uh, the responding words, right? Um, just very quickly responding to the question that was raised. Um, as I mentioned, just looking for the right opportunities and the political moments. And I, I recall, um, there's a, in policy analysis field, we talk about kingdom three streams model where policy, context, and uh, politics, when these three parallel streams come together, there's always a window of opportunity which allow for policy change and translation. And, um, I, and at least of the examples that I have seen while working with uh, policymakers or planners, uh, 
um, I've realized that, that context is particularly important. Um, it, it has taken, for example, it has taken uh, several years to get um, councils uh, and the sort of policy makers to recognize inequalities. And what we've seen, I mean, there was a huge resistance in the UK as well to, um, to use the term inequalities. Uh, and some parts continue to talk about differences or discrepancies and do not want to confront the, the social justice element of inequalities. But what we're seeing now in many councils, in many care boards, there is reference to the term inequality. Those are our spaces uh, to um, influence. So we're currently working with two or three sort of different regions in, in England in looking at how uh, intersectional um, analysis, how ideas of power privilege can be incorporated into um, a, a, a strategy of making um, Manchester or making Essex fair, right? So I think those are really moments where you can uh, ensure that different constituencies come together. Uh, and at times there are trade-offs to be had, what language to use, who do you uh, reach with what kind of languages. Uh, and and that, that's just responding to your question. I think the debate uh, that you um, initiated, I mean, is, is one that we must have after this over wine, because um, I think even just approaching that debate is a matter of power and privilege, where you stand in that hierarchy. I can uh, say, and I've been uh, trying to introduce participative models in uh, higher education systems, which are extremely, uh, hierarchic, hierarchicalized, um, uh, and um, I, I can expect, I, I can talk about ideas of collectivism, but in the end, uh, the more uh, junior staff has to go through the pathways to permanency models, have to be fairly individual and protective of their uh, uh, time, their work, uh, which is antithetical to what we would want to develop and how we would want to approach education or how we would want to approach any other sector. So I think it is not, it, it is not uh, an, a very simple, simplistic answer. But I think when we interact with um, people, ideas of collectivism and together with the feminist principle of personalizing the politics is extremely key. It's a very hard road uh, and tight road to walk, but uh, that's the only way, that's the only way change can happen until and unless we extend those and there will be sufferings, but I think the more that people are together and standing together and expressing that ideas of collectivism, uh, the easier it is for those who are lower in the hierarchy uh, and, and struggling uh, to, to uh, meet the objectives. I, I, there was a question that probably um, uh, would be answered, but I just want to just say, what, I mean, and in, in, the, in the this note, that Africa or any region uh, will never be able to address their problems if you're, they're looking at the West to answer the, uh, to come up with solutions. So for me, that that's very clear. When we talk about decoloniality, when we talk about anti-coloniality, and in fact, COVID is a classic example because the West did not have its house in order. It really, um, many countries in the West uh, performed more poorly than many countries in uh, the global South. And we know, I mean, there are a number of factors um, underpinning that and there's no simplistic answer. One being, of course, that many countries were more prepared because they have had experiences of uh, similar pandemics in the past, and you could see the states that were really doing well uh, were those that had their community health workforce uh, uh, and the primary health care, uh, comprehensive health care approach so, uh, sorted. So I do not think uh, the West is any in any position to recommend solutions for, um, for Africa, uh, but there are things that we need to learn across the borders, and there are several solutions and innovations that uh, that we've seen and documented uh, in the COVID uh, crisis uh, from the global south, and there's much to uh, learn there. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, thank you for closing. Um, so that uh, I second everything you said. Um, I I would.
glad that I um, don't think any country society is prepared for the next pandemic. I think, in fact, that this, this very discourse is a bit futile. Um, the idea that we can be prepared for a pandemic, I don't think we can. And it's not that if you do X, that you're better prepared. I think there are ways to think about how you can protect society better. Um, and that's true in Africa as it is in Europe, as it is in, in Asia. I'm really uh, encouraged and excited about those um, houses public health communities are forming in various African countries. Um, and um, I'm hoping also that those um, scientific um, advocacy communities are successful in lobbying governments to spend more on healthcare, primary healthcare, public health. I think um, what is really needed is more domestic funding for this. I, I talked a lot about uh, organizations that are merging in Africa on this, but the, a lot of funding for these organizations is still coming from abroad. And as long as that is the case, the agenda will also be shaped very much from outside. So uh, more funding from African states for healthcare, public health is, 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 is very important. Um, the only other point I wanted to make, perhaps sort of in response to questions about how we approach policymakers, but also issues of silos, and something you said in Australia about the need to dialogue. Um, I, I think the, for me, one of the most important things we need to do is to listen more, to um, listen before forming an opinion, forming a position ourselves, but to try and understand more and to talk to others, especially to those that we think we don't agree with. Um, there's no point in, as someone said earlier, talking to ourselves maybe. It, I think what we really need to do is to listen to and dialogue with people we don't agree with. Um, that for me is sort of one, one issue I'm trying myself to do much more of uh, in my own personal and professional life. Um, so, I remember that. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm not going to add to this great final words of your three. Um, I just give the final uh, off, um, and I want to, but I thank first all my panelists, and uh, maybe you can clap a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And of course, I need a big applause for all the supporters for all the staff people from <laughs> 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 <laughs>